Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. I appreciate you. This week we're discussing the unresolved case of Jessica Johnson. I don't want to say much because I want the audience to formulate their own opinions about the circumstances surrounding her death. So please join me as we remember Jessica Johnson. Jessica Renee Johnson was born on August 30th, 1979 to parents David and Linda Johnson. The Johnsons lived together in Horn Lake, Mississippi. Jessica was described by both family and friends as outgoing and free-spirited. She loved being around people and was not judgmental. Jessica was described as the light at any gathering she attended. She had a way of making people feel comfortable, and it was always a fun time with her around. Her mother stated her daughter cared a lot about her appearance. Jessica loved to dress up and always looked her best. She was very much about her beauty. The one thing Jessica loved more than life itself, however, were her two children. With the help of her parents, Jessica raised her son and daughter as a single mother. Regardless, Jessica was always there for her children. She was proud to be their mother and was very dedicated to her entire family. Jessica was a great person, but at times would fall off the right track. She had a previous history of substance abuse, which often resulted in her hanging around an undesirable crowd. One of the members in this particular group was her on and off again boyfriend, Garland Hart. Jessica recently dated a few men that, according to her family, were not her type. In fact, they felt Jessica was usually picky with her partners, and her recent boyfriends were actually a surprising choice. Many of them were described as mean, controlling, and narcissistic with a bad boy image, and Garland checked all of these boxes. Garland and Jessica's relationship was described as toxic, and despite the disapproval of friends and family alike, she wouldn't leave him for good. On May 31st, 2017, Jessica told her mother she was going to stay with her boyfriend after the two went shopping, and would let her know when she would be back. This was the last time her family saw her alive. The following day, June 1st, Lisa felt something was off. After texting Jessica and receiving no response, she grew worried, since it was very uncharacteristic of Jessica to not even let her know she was okay. In fact, Lisa claimed Jessica was so great about checking in with her that she would often send her her location on her phone, but this day was radio silent. The truth wouldn't be known until the next morning. Approximately 10 a.m. on Friday, June 2, 2017, a mail carrier on her usual route stumbled upon the 37-year-old woman's body hidden in the tall grass. Jessica was found resting on her knees against a mailbox. A pair of shoelaces were tied in a makeshift noose, which was then looped around her neck and tied around the mailbox post. The mail carrier called for help, and police arrived on the scene. At first glance, police ruled Jessica had taken her own life. On the ground between her legs sat her half-open purse. Several steps from the body were her unlaced shoes. Jessica was taken to the coroner's office, where her family received the unfortunate news. Immediately, her family didn't believe Jessica could have done this to herself. She wouldn't just leave her children behind. Her mother felt the method in which she used was very unlike her. Linda felt if Jessica did do this, it would have been a gentler approach by using Xanax, her drug of choice. She also stated Jessica wouldn't have put herself on display without making sure she looked her best before doing so. When they saw the pictures of how Jessica was found, they all felt it was a staged scene. Initially, it was stated no autopsy was performed on Jessica. The medical examiner did find marks on the backs of her hands and what appeared to be a shoe print on her forearm. It was ruled Jessica's death to be asphyxiation due to ligature strangulation by her own hand. The house Jessica was found at was only five miles from her parents' home and actually belonged to a friend of Garland's. Linda stated Jessica didn't go to this house often, only when Garland would stay there from time to time, and it was known for shady business. The house was the last place anyone saw Jessica alive. On Thursday the night before she was found, 
Several witnesses, including the owner of the home, claim Jessica and Garland got into a big fight. Jessica locked herself in the bathroom for nearly an hour where she called a friend for help. She asked the friend to come pick her up from the location, but when the friend arrived, they were asked to leave since Jessica changed her mind and decided to stay there with Garland. This happened often, according to Jessica's friends. Garland and Jessica's relationship was dark, and Jessica admitted on several occasions that she knew Garland could hurt her. When questioned, the owner of the home felt something was off about Jessica that night. She appeared to be lovesick and dramatic. It was the first time the couple were seen together in months. When Garland didn't acknowledge Jessica's apparent discomfort, it led to the argument. Per the owner of the home, Jessica was seen shortly after the argument, outside in the driveway, removing the laces from her shoes, where she threatened to hurt herself. The homeowner told Jessica she needed to leave. This was around 6 p.m. Thursday night. No one claims to have seen Jessica again until her body was discovered around 16 hours later. Allegedly, Jessica did reach out to two people via text messages, the homeowner and her son. Shortly after leaving the home, Jessica sent a message to the owner stating she didn't want to feel pain anymore. The text message to her son was received at 3.49 a.m. and just stated she was spending time with Garland. Based upon the coroner's findings, this last message was sent around eight hours before her body was discovered. So this text message was determined to be sent right around the time she died or possibly even after. Police did bring Garland in for questioning, but he was cleared. They never officially named him or anyone else a suspect in her death. Jessica's family, however, didn't believe her death investigation was handled by authorities properly. They felt that due to Jessica's history of substance abuse and the friends she kept, it made police treat her case differently than if it had been a suburban housewife. Rather than accept the ruling, they hired a private forensic scientist, Dr. Morris Godwin, to examine Jessica's case. Dr. Godwin, who's been linked to high-profile cases such as the Casey Anthony case, felt just as strong as the Johnsons that this was a homicide investigation. During his own investigation, Dr. Godwin discovered a partial autopsy was performed on Jessica. During this autopsy, it was discovered she had two types of drugs in her system, however, they were not the cause of her death. Dr. Godwin also expressed concerns in the way Jessica was found. The mailbox was just over three feet tall and was not sturdy at all. Her hand was found resting on her purse, which he felt wouldn't be the case her body would struggle and convulse. Her hair was found tangled in the shoelace and Dr. Godwin stated no deep marks were found on her neck. He didn't feel the shoelaces could have applied enough pressure on her neck from the angle she was sitting. The shoelaces were also found tied together at their ends, which would have been difficult for her to tie on her own, especially in the dark. Potential evidence from Jessica's case was also turned over to the family, where Dr. Godwin observed what he felt was a blood spatter on her shoe. The metal connector on the strap of her purse was broken, something that could have only been accomplished with extreme force. Other evidence, such as her clothes and the shoestrings, were nowhere to be found. Allegedly, the evidence and crime scene were mishandled. Her clothes were destroyed by the funeral director who received them in a biohazard bag and was unaware they should have been kept. Critical evidence could have possibly been destroyed as well due to a lack of crime scene preservation. Everyone who viewed the area her body was found were confused since there were plenty of low-lying trees for her to use. Why a mailbox that wasn't sturdy? Unfortunately, Jessica's family had to make the difficult decision to cremate Jessica's body due to financial reasons, so she cannot be further tested. They also felt the police were certain they had everything needed to investigate. It was also discovered that not all of the neighbors were questioned about Jessica, and the home she was found at had a camera facing the mailbox. Police did an attempt to get this footage from the owner of the home, and when he was later questioned about it, he came up with several excuses as to why he didn't have it anymore. The family were also unable to access Jessica's cell phone. Half a dozen people were in and out of the house Jessica was discovered at, but yet no one saw Jessica next to the mailbox. 
Per the individual investigation, it seemed impossible that no one would see her body. Dr. Godwin fully believes that Jessica was murdered somewhere else and later tied to the mailbox. The homeowner doesn't believe Garland is responsible, but Linda felt differently. She feels he knows more than what he is telling. Shortly after her death, Garland went to court for a previous assault charge on a different woman. He cooperated with the investigation and claimed he and Jessica loved each other and he wouldn't do that to her. Garland also doesn't believe Jessica did this to herself. According to Linda, prior to Jessica's death, she told her mother, Mom, if anything happens to me, look for him. This him, according to Linda, is Garland Hart. Jessica loved life, which made her death a hard one for her family to consider. This case is currently active and ongoing. If you or anyone you know has information about Jessica Johnson's death, you are encouraged to contact the Horn Lake Police Department. I'll have the number on the screen and also in the description of the video. Her family wants answers. Hi friends, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. This case was very reminiscent for me of the Samantha Sharkis video I covered last year. And if you haven't seen that, I'll go ahead and put a pop up in the corner of this video so you can check it out. Also, I want to mention this case, it's been covered before, but it's been a while. So if you've heard this and you've seen the photo of Jessica, please know that um, I understand, from my understanding, her family did approve the release of the photo but I just don't feel comfortable doing that by putting it in this video. So um, I know there might be somebody who mentions that there is a photo out there in the comments and there is a photo. If you're interested in seeing the photo just to kind of see what they're talking about, you can look at it. Obviously you have free will, but viewer discretion is advised. It's very unsettling and very sad. And I'm just not going to put someone's death image up there like that for the public to see, even though the family seems to be okay with it because I think her mother is just trying to get answers and it's a way of helping the investigation. So again, free will, do with that as you will. I'm not going to put it here, just so you all understand because I'm sure someone knows about the photo being out there. But as always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so leave them in the comments below and we can chat about this. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you my friends for checking out the first video of 2023. You're all the best. I hope you have a great week ahead of you and stay safe out there my friends. I will see you in the next one. Bye!